as we uh, chomp into your lunchtime, please continue your own chomping. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, for a, a lunchtime uh, uh, discussion, this is an a perfectly uh, appropriate uh, set of distinguished guests uh, to have with us. And in fact, uh, how do we break the ice uh, for a, a mealtime discussion? Of course, this might be it in today's new ad release, uh, a little bit uh, different style than our guests are used to. To show you just how much people are loving Taco Bell's all-new breakfast, we asked some very special people. My name is Ronald McDonald. You're home! I am Ronald McDonald. I'm Ronald McDonald Jr., and this is Ronald McDonald III. <laughs> My name is Ronald McDonald. What do you think? That's really good. I was surprised how good it is. I love the new AM Crunch Wrap. I'm Ronald McDonald. Ronald McDonald. I'm Ronald McDonald, and I love Taco Bell's new breakfast. Delicious new breakfast everyone can love. Even Ronald McDonald. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> then they, uh. you talk about ambush advertising and things, but then they kill it all by actually displaying the product there. Uh, uh, now, uh, if you want to find out uh, what that product actually is, they actually have a, a new combination waffle sandwich, which is, which is true, but it's often harder to satire in the food business for sure. Uh, reality, uh, it gets... Special southwestern sauce. Then we wrap it in a soft flour tortilla with a layer of refried beans in between. Sweet. <laughs> then we wrap that in a savory corn tortilla. <laughs> and jack cheese. Awesome. And it gets even awesomer when we take a deep fried gordita shell, smear on a layer of our special <laughs> sauce, and wrap that around the outside. <laughs> it gets bigger. Because we uh. make it in a corn husk filled with pico de gallo, <laughs> authentic Parisian crate filled with egg, Gruyere, merguez sausage. <laughs> <laughs> sure, but not before we take the whole thing. I love that. <laughs> Get a copy of that video. Oh, sure. Absolutely. <laughs> show it and they're off. <laughs> so, <laughs> there they are. If McDonald's wanted to figure out how to do the retaliatory advertising, Saturday Night Live already has their retaliatory piece ready. And if nobody else in the room liked it, uh, because I only grade some of you, so maybe some of your laughter was sincere, so maybe it wasn't. I know that our distinguished guest, Tim, liked it, and he's already asked me for copies of it, so we'll, <laughs> we'll get that off to you. But in case you didn't like it at all, to help bring a little dignity, to, dignity and wisdom and erudition to the event, we're lucky to have, uh, to, uh, that is in addition to our guests, have uh, Ravi Dar, of course, who is a uh, quite uh, renowned uh, scholar, as many of you will probably all know uh, Ravi uh, in the world of marketing is the director of the Center for Customer Insight, a, a quite a prominent a marketing scholar here. You name the award, he's won it, but this is not about Ravi, so I won't do the full introduction on Ravi, other than he wants me to tell you that the reason he is attired like this, he wants to look like the chief marketing officer, and he said for me to be the CEO, I think for me to be the undertaker is more like it. Uh, but uh, 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 nonetheless, uh, <laughs> There's one other person who uh, decided, uh, in, including uh, uh, Tim Shea here, to uh, help make sure that we are facilitated properly here to dress like an undertaker is uh, Dean uh, Robert Post, who is here to add true erudition and scholarly depth because our guest today, and, and uh, uh, Dean Post, as many of you know, is a uh, renowned uh, constitutional uh, scholar and also a Yale alum, but also a Harvard alum, right? Uh, as you are, too, Tim, right? Yeah, so uh, we have uh, various bases covered. Uh, but uh, I can say this, uh, as I intended to mention this, without Dean Post in the room, it was a Harvard alum, happily, not a Yale alum, who did say that, referring to uh, law schools, but he might have made, meant professional schools in general, said that uh, law schools, uh, uh, this is Oliver Wendell Holmes, had said this, I think our longest reigning uh, Supreme Court justice, maybe 30 years, uh, uh, 40 years as a judge, uh, he said uh, that they think they make, uh, law schools think they make minds sharp by making them narrow. 
you know, sort of the pointy type. Uh, but what's important is that the Yale Law School, that's never been the case. And we could take any, any handful, any fistful, any, any portfolio of past or recent graduates to make the case, or the scholarship uh, and, uh, on their faculty, and to see that there's a very rich portfolio of minds. But our guests today are perfect examples how law schools, in fact, do not necessarily lead to narrowing, uh, even though they improve their, their wisdom and certainly their erudition and their eloquence. We have uh, Nina and Tim um, Zagat, who of course are both uh, great uh, graduates of the Yale Law School, and in fact were both practicing attorneys at the time they founded the famed uh, Zagat uh, surveys. They married during law school uh, and uh, graduated, uh, I believe, in 1966, moved to New York where they became corporate lawyers. Uh, she was at the uh, the white shoe firm of uh, Sher uh, Sherman Sterling and uh, and and and, uh, and Tim uh, Nina was there and Tim was uh, at uh, I believe at Hughes Hubbard uh, at an another uh, equally distinguished firm and they went off uh, to compile their own list of favorite Parisian restaurants what they liked and didn't like and that helped lead to uh, a giant leap which I know Ravi wants to understand how they got from that giant leap to the idea for a new type of restaurant rating guide. It might have seemed obvious to them, but an awful lot of people toured Parisian restaurants before them and didn't seem to come up with this idea. And they returned to New York. They solicited opinions of friends about New York restaurants. And the resulting compilation, of course, became this, uh, this Bible of dining, which we, we, we all know, and which uh, Ravi and I, we always carry. Ravi, do you have yours with you by chance? Yes, right you, there, we, yeah. we never go anywhere without it. Just <laughs> never know where you're going to have a guest and need to race off somewhere. Although I shudder to see how New Haven comes up in the book. Here, we'll have to take a look. Uh, and uh, the, the, the guide was first published in 1982. Uh, it was uh, in New York City sold for, uh, there, it sold about 7,500 copies. Uh, then, uh, two years later, it was already 40,000 uh, copies a year. And they quit their jobs as corporate lawyers to devote, to devote a, a full time job to actually having a lot of fun at the same time to produce this, this great uh, guide. And uh, I think in um, 2011, I, I think is when you guys sold it to, uh, to Google. Yeah. That was right. Uh, if to be indiscreet, I think it was for 125 million, but who wants to talk about money here at a Venus School of you're, Business? You're, you're, uh, living, uh, you're getting a little low there. Oh, oh, okay. I thought it was a little, okay. Well, there were some big earnouts involved in it, which I'm sure I missed in the deal. And uh, uh, one, uh, in describing the methodology, it's been described uh, in, in, in an awful lot of ways uh, where we just take a look at the, uh, at the, at the rating uh, system for its uh, pioneering approaches. It, they've been extremely well decorated at one um, NASDAQ event. I must say that I, uh, I went to uh, uh, that was for uh, uh, leading NASDAQ uh, companies uh, probably about a dozen years ago. Uh, they were there and they were with you know Meg Whitman, uh, and all these great stars of NASDAQ, uh, Craig Barrett, the, C the then CEO of, uh, of Intel was there and the, the real stars of the event were the two of them until Ravi did a presentation and everybody <laughs> raved about Ravi's presentation. And I spent the rest of my time trying to make great contact with these superstars, Tim and Nina, to talk about our CEO summits and things. And all they wanted to do was to talk about how brilliant Ravi was. So uh, <laughs> maybe that was Ravi at his all-time high, but I don't know. But, it is, uh, but anyhow, so I, we, we realized that this, this talk po could not possibly happen uh, with, without Ravi. Uh, if I go on a sentence longer and, and read through the, the tremendous awards uh, pile that they have as Entrepreneurs of the Year by uh, Ernst & Young and the Food and Beverage and the Hall of Honors and Hospitality and the rest, if I went through the details, they won't have a chance to say a thing. Uh, so let me, if I could, uh, turn the, the show over to, uh, to, to Tim and Nita, and, and welcome for joining us today. Um, I just want you to know we brought along a tie for erudition purposes <laughs> um, and to prove that we were older. Uh, secondly, this is really, I think, should be an opportunity to ask questions. I know you guys are prepared, but... Uh, let me give you a few areas of, uh, that you might want to think about in asking your own questions. <clears throat> uh, one, and we always ask people what they'd like to hear about, and then we let them vote on what they'd like. Uh, you know, this is in the spirit of surveying. So I'm not surveying you, really, but I'm suggesting areas of interest. One, what is it about surveying that you should know? And democracy. Number two, the history of Zagat survey as the, really we were the first uh, user-generated content. But 
<clears throat> what were the entrepreneurial lessons we learned uh, in the course of over 30 years starting a mom and pop hobby, really, and developing it into a business? Thirdly, what has been the history of the revolution of food during the same relevant period? Because food has changed uh, in our lifetimes uh, immeasurably. You may not know it, but um, if you started in 1979 when we did, uh, food in America, and in fact food all over the world, was very, very different than it is today. And finally, what are the things that we couldn't publish because as lawyers we knew they were libelous? And um, what our lawyers told us that although we get these wonderful quotes from people, uh, certain ones of them cannot be published. What were those quotes? And uh, if you ask about those quotes, we'll be glad to tell you what they were. Uh, now, I'm sure I've missed something. Oh, would you like to know about the marketing of the canning industry in the 1860s? <laughs> I think we should turn it over to Robbie. No, I, think, I, that, know has. <laughs> I think it's a great idea that, you know, it is user generated, so I think if you want to, you know, the way we want to do this is I'll start with a couple of questions, but feel free any time to ask your own. I think that's really what the spirit of this uh, event is. Uh, and especially around the entrepreneurship, I think, and I'll start there basically. You mentioned some of the lessons learned, but basically, you know, you're working, both of you are working in law firms for several years now. Deciding you started this as a hobby. So just tell us how it started, what made you, what are the, lessons you learned along the way that you want to pass along, but also how did you become confident that this is something that's going to get paid? And I know, Nina, you said you have two different versions of that's this. That's right. I'd like to hear from both of you. Yeah. You have Nina's version and Tim's version. <laughs> <laughs> but we're looking at it from different points of view and different points in time. <clears throat> Basically, the way I always see it is that we began during the two years that we were living in Paris in 1968 and 69. I was there for Sherman and Sterling and Tim for Hughes, Hubbard, and Reed. And we were sent over for six months. So we felt that we had to cram in every bit of experience we possibly could in those six months. And we started from, even before we left New York, making a list of all the restaurants, because everybody said, oh, you're going to Paris. Well, this is my favorite place. So we had a list of all the places that people recommended to us. And then over time, we added all the places that were in the different guides that existed at that time. And we had across the top columns to show what the ratings were from the Michelin, from the Gomio, from Calibre Colomb. So we could look across for at any restaurant and see what the ratings were across the board. Fortunately, none of those guys saw this thing. Otherwise, we'd have been sued <laughs> for a copyright infringement. But it gave us a road map on two sides of a legal sheet of paper of places that when somebody said, let's go out to dinner, or we were asked more often than not by our offices because it was more entertaining to do in Paris than anybody could handle. And we wanted to be sure we covered all these places in our six-month time. Of course, we were very fortunate and our time ended up extending for two years. So we had you know, more and more time to grow our list, and everybody wanted copies of it. It was extremely popular, because here was a very convenient way to get a lot of information about restaurants. We also showed the type of food that they served, and um, it just was extremely popular. So that, to me, it looks if you looked at it, you'd see how similar it looks to our first New York City survey. And it was sort of the bud of an idea. And then Tim can tell you how he sees the survey, which is really the development of that idea into what became a survey. Well, the things we were trying to accomplish were, one, totally local, because we were asking people to share their experience about local things. Two, it was mobile, because we wanted to be able to carry this thing in our pockets and be easy. So we were the, more mobile than anybody had ever seen. And um, we uh, wanted it to be a social experience. And all of those things, when we went around to publishers, they all turned us down, uh, including my uncle, who was the guy behind 
a major publishing house in New York who said, he had published the New York Times Guide and said they never sold more than 35,000 copies, so how many would we expect to sell? Uh, the year after uh, he said that, we were selling 75,000 copies a month and decided to uh, thank him for his advice. <laughs> um, but it, it, the way I see it is starting is, in New York, we were members of the Food and Wine Society, and somebody who was then head of the society, a major uh, art dealer, started dumping on the then critic of the, rest of the New York Times, who he said was irrelevant, obnoxious, arrogant, and a few other understatements. And um, he really went at her. And I said, well, why don't we do, I had already had my eighth glass of wine, and so had he. And when he finally stopped, he said, why don't we do a survey of our friends? And we had 20 people at table. Everybody, give us 10 friends who you think would enjoy participating in a survey of restaurants. And we did, and they did, and the first year, uh, and I wouldn't have started this if I hadn't been drunk at the time. <laughs> so, I mean, a lot of these things don't really get thought out. We had no idea we were gonna ever be a business. It was a hobby. And for three years, we did it free of charge. In the first year, we had 200 people. Second year, 500. Third year, 1,000. Now, you may figure it out, if you haven't already, that Nina is more uh, careful, contained, analytic uh, than I am. And Nina, at the end of the third year, said, this is get hobbies getting out, getting too expensive for two young lawyers. We've got to find a way of making some money back. And that's how we decided to get into business of selling these things. And we never dreamed that it would become, actually, within three years, we were making more money in a month from our hobby than we were practicing law together in a year. Wow. So it shows you that some of these things are unexpected. There were a lot of learnings that we had during the course of the next 20 or 30 years. And Nina probably is better to relate those than I am. Uh, but one of them uh, was that um, it never hurts to have a little luck. And um, that's, we certainly had that. And then also, do something you really love. Do it, we started as a hobby. We did it because we loved it, we did it for free. And you never can complain if you, even if you don't make money, if you're doing something you like to do every day, you'll be a lot happier, and in my opinion, a lot more successful then if you just go in the, uh, the big company, which both of us have experienced, and uh, do whatever somebody else tells you to do, whether or not you like it. So um, we had the good fortune of finding something we love to do and turning that into something that was successful. And I think we were uh, more successful as a result than we would have been if we had uh, just done what looked like the easy thing, getting into a big company. You have to realize that um, the costs were completely different from the way they would be today. For us to do those original surveys, we had to prepare a list of restaurants, have them, cop have them typeset, have them copied, mail them out to people. Well, first you had to put them in, get somebody to put them in envelopes, mail them out, have people fill them out with pens. You remember, remember pens and paper, <laughs> pa those are things. If you haven't seen one, we can give you some later. Send them back to you. Then we had to have people input all that data. Tell about who was inputting. Wait a they, had to, they had to input all that data. And then we'd get printouts of all that information, pages, I mean, books full of printouts of all that information. And then we'd um, have to sit down and put all the numbers together, which came, you know, which were just a result of uh, that was done by computer. But all the editing, you'd have to go through all these lists of comments and try to whittle them down to the very short reviews that we had um, on paper and then in our guide. So that, I mean, the cost structure was just totally different from what it was, what it would be today. So if you don't, that's just to give you some background. The, the now, main difference in cost was we were working for free. Right, well that's true too. But you know, when I said to Tim, my goodness, this is getting so expensive, 
it was because of all those expenses that today, if you were to start a similar business, wouldn't really exist because you could do it all online. And then ultimately we did end up doing it online, but you know, you we started, were way ahead. Would you have started it faster uh, and not had the uh, two year delay of enjoying the hobby and, uh, and uh, listening to that, that crazy uncle discouraging you? Would you have gotten into it faster if it didn't have the prohibitive barriers? I mean, you think of uh, so often the, the revolution of technology, what it's done to manufacturing, we don't often think enough about in the service sector, all those different industries from from, from distribution and, and, and data entry and, and printing and graphics and everything else you've told us about, that that's disappeared, uh, data analysis and everything, that, that's all gone now. That's right. I don't, to answer your question, I'm not sure, because at that time, remember where our mindset was. Mm. We were happy practicing law. We were doing this for fun. Our friends loved it, and it was only because our friends and friends of friends and everybody else wanted copies and and so many people participated and there were restaurants kept you know increasing in number that we had this delay and then we decided well gee you know it's expensive and maybe we should publish it and the idea wasn't for us to publish it, it we went to every major publisher in New York and through my firm, we represented Scribner's, Doubleday, a lot of places that don't exist anymore. I had two firms. Magazines. Forbes. I had Simon & Schuster and Prentice Hall reporting to me in my job then, and they both turned me down. You know you have a problem when people who work for you turn you down. And the, the, the interesting thing is that, uh, so we wouldn't have gone that route if it hadn't what gotten did, what so did expensive. What Michelin but then, to you? Oh, they didn't, they weren't really relevant to the whole discussion at that point, because we weren't going to them to be a publisher, and they didn't know they, they didn't seriously. they didn't take us seriously, yeah. and so and we don't take them seriously now. <laughs> well, you know, some others don't either. You know, on on that theme, this is just something recently that was in the New York Times talking about you versus Michelin. Uh, that just sort of comes to mind uh, is that as you look through what they were saying about you guys versus Michelin, they they talk about uh, you know the juxtaposition of just your technology and things. They say the Michelin rating system is a combination of the Edsel and the Yugo, a clearly outmoded uh, source of reliable information, sends anonymous inspectors to check out every restaurant, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's that restaurants get short shrift because the entries in the guide contain outdated uh, information gleaned from press releases. And this is what they're saying now. Even more problematic is the Michelin's rating system uh, criteria that they use. And they go on at, at more length, and they think it's time for the Michelin Guide to get new tires because right now it's flat and needs to be taken off the road. Uh, it's clear the Michelin guides have gotten you know very little traction. Uh, you know they talk about how the Michelin guides will you know focus on the kinds of flatware and stemware that's being used, and, as opposed to the food. Uh, is, how come they didn't learn in the last thirty years? You know, I think they might have. Well, 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 <laughs> I just you, you're doing everything you do. I want a copy. <laughs> I, I never saw that, so I'm glad if I could see that. I'd love to. Yeah, well, I, I mean, if I had any notes, I'd give them to you. As you can right. see, I'm just making it up on the fly, but. Uh, <laughs> Well, it's, it's interesting, because they really haven't gone anywhere. And, um, you know, I, I, I have a bunch of thoughts going through my mind, but we only started going into the technological side of things after we had been publishing from 82 until um, 1999 was when we had our first website in May of 99. Mm which was a huge change, but I wanted to remember to tell you why all the publishers turned us down. They, and we got, you know, we put together the answers which were basically the same from everybody. Well, people don't want to hear from other people like them. They want to hear from experts. Right. Nobody will buy a book in the size that you're recommending, these small books that people can put in their pocket. Right. because they'll get lost on the shelves of a bookstore. So being social and being mobile were reasons not to publish it, and also being um, local. They said people want a national guide. They don't want local information. That was the combined wisdom of the publishing industry and maybe some indication of why the industry is having so many problems. Well, if and they they're, were... they're, the exact, they're the exact reasons 
why Google wanted to own our company. Uh, well, <coughs> now, uh, was it your idea to go to Google or Google came to you? you Google wanted, you came said you to wa us. But you wanted a digital partner anyway, right? Yeah, but... Um, we were digital before they came to us. Right. Yeah, way before. I mean, we were digital in 99, and they came to us in early uh, 2011. How's it worked out with Google? It's been great. Uh, it's... Uh, <laughs> my, my students are suspicious. Robbie, it depends. I Wait, let me answer that also. It's in some ways more fun to run your own company than to have somebody else running your company. That being said, we couldn't be happier being part of Google, and we do not think they completely botched the gap. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, I, I, we don't need to sort of go through it all, but basically they're, they're arguing that... Uh, they think that some qualities uh, that they, they've kind of hurt the, the product that you've created, some of it has to do with them handling their own technology well rather than getting in the way of, uh, of the service you offer. It just had to do with the quality of their own devices. But do you, do you need a copy of this one? Uh, you've seen it. Yeah, I know I need a copy of everything. <laughs> everything you do, I need a copy. Uh, <laughs> well, Good or bad? What's going, what are the you lessons? Know, what, Nina, what are the lessons? We really did learn a lot of lessons. Are we talking about lessons of Google or lessons of Zagat? Which are, what, Zagat first and then Google. Right. Tell okay. the things. I mean, I think in terms of, of the question that I think Ravi was originally asking about entrepreneurship. Because I think probably many of you are interested in ultimately being entrepreneurs. How many of you are interested in becoming entrepreneurs? Wow. Yeah, I, I mean, I know that there's a strong desire to go out and start your own business. And um, I guess what I would say is, had Tim and I done that straight out of law school, we would have gotten nowhere. Hmm. Um, my first recommendation would be that you get out and get some real experience on somebody else's dime. I think the fact that we practiced law for a long time, and it doesn't have to be as long as we did, but the fact that we practiced law, or if we hadn't practiced law, if we had gone to work for some company and learned how business is done, um, it, it's invaluable, and I'd say absolutely necessary. If somebody says to you, to start you in an, your own business, I'm sorry. If somebody says to you in an interview, if you ask them long term where they'd want to go, and that, that they say they would like to be an entrepreneur, do you lose interest in them, or uh, that they're not going to be? I mean, there's some reason. You mean why interviewing at Google? Interviewing, yeah, with you guys. Uh, yeah. Because you know, every hand but two went in the air when you asked about the entrepreneurship question. And then after hesitation, yes, Sarah, eventually you put your hand up and figure, well, if everybody else is, because you're thinking, maybe I want a job here. And if I tell them I want to uh, be an entrepreneur, uh, you know, she was afraid to admit it. I was wondering. No, I think I would regard that as a positive thing. So, I mean, there are the two sides. I'd say absolutely do it. But also, um, I would never hold it against somebody in an interview. I mean, the fact is that if you look at the workforce today, people don't stay at companies or law firms the way they did when we got out of law school. I mean, people are not taking jobs because they expect to be there for the next 20 years. They even hop around law firms now, and they didn't That's every right. Year, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I remember when that started, I was absolutely shocked, you know, because our mindset when we got out of law school was, and, and, and friends who were in business school at the time, you went with a company and you were going to make your future. That was the way you spent the rest of your life. Hmm. And that just doesn't exist anymore. Of course, that was 1911 when we were doing that. <laughs> <laughs> but also, I mean, at, that was certainly true at Zagat. But now that Zagat is part of Google, it's even more true because people are moving around all the time. And in fact, part of the retention uh, approach at Google is if you want to work in another part of the company, you let the HR person in your area know, and they'll help you move oh. to another part of the company. Mm. So that, you know, if you want to try something different, we at least don't have to lose you. So Google's been good for recruiting talent then, too. It's opened up it's more great. Career. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. It's been voted year after year as the number one place to work in the world. And there, I, I think there are a lot of good reasons for that. Can I get back to the entrepreneurship? Yeah. And then I think I'll want to open it to the to our students to ask questions. The, the question I have is, and this is, you know, you, both of you mentioned, and everybody mentions this, you should be passionate and enjoy what you do. And, you have to be. and it's true about our research as, as what we do also. But there's always this 
tension between, you know, if my passion is sufficient when I'm getting feedback, you know, this will not work from the publishers in your case or the restaurants, and who the hell are you guys who do evaluate us? You did have maybe an early feedback from the consumers, the end users, that they love the idea, but sometimes you don't get that early on. So what kind of advice would you give to people who want to get, you know, where do you decide you're being insane or stupid versus the power of your conviction and continuing? Is there a, is there a healthy balance here in some ways? Uh, you want to answer? I, mean, I just, I can only speak from my own experience, which was that the feedback we got from the very beginning was so incredibly popular, even when we were doing the totally informal, completely different thing in Paris. Everybody loved it. Mm -hmm. And then when we came to New York and just felt there wasn't any information available and kept the same thing, two sides of a legal sheet of paper with information about the restaurants and the ratings, just the way we do now, food, decor, service, the price, and some comments. Um, you know, that's the way we started, and people loved it. And that's why it got to be so expensive. And then when we expensive printed, to do when we printed guides, and you know we were learning each stage as we went along. When we printed the guides and we got them back from the printer, we hadn't thought through sort of the next stage how we were going to distribute them. So we stuck them in the back of our station wagon and drove up Madison Avenue and down Lexington and took turns running into bookstores <laughs> saying, won't you carry our guides? And, and, <laughs> and we, we used to take one of our two sons and put him in the front seat, a little five-year-old, and oh. we figured we'd get less tickets when we double parked in front of bookstores. But work? it was amazing. <laughs> it worked. Yeah. But it was so amazing. But, thankfully, Rudy Giuliani was not mayor then. <laughs> <laughs> right. But, but He'd some, been arrested for child abuse. That's right. But some places were very snotty. And said, oh, we don't carry privately published guides. And other places said, well, sure. You know, can we take them? And then we'll pay you once we sell them. And we said, sure, you'll take them. Great. Mm. And then when there were big snowstorms, it was about November when we started circulating the first guides. And in, in December, before Christmas, when it was snowing and the roads were terrible and they'd call up being out of guides, we were at the ready to run over with more books. I mean, we were just, we were practicing law, but we were still, you know, this was our passion. And um, nothing was going to keep us down. It was more like, Tim, get the car and drive <laughs> over there. Uh, but uh, I, I, I don't think you really answered that really in a more generic and uh, general way. Um, you know, there are lots and lots of ways of starting companies, and there are, for every rule, there's an exception. You have uh, Larry Page and uh, Sergey Brin, uh, who didn't finish college, or if they did, I guess they had. Uh, but then you get uh, Bill Gates, who didn't finish college. Well, that was Harvard. Yeah, well, you know that. <laughs> uh, but you have a lot of people who are very young who get an idea and go with it and have not had as much education as we probably did or as experience. But education and experience are good things, and they help. Uh, it helps also to be brilliant and have an idea that nobody's ever thought of as that's a great idea. There are a lot of other and ideas that relate to, uh, to entrepreneurship that I think we should elaborate, Nina. <laughs> well, particularly, what did you have in mind, Tim? Oh, come on. <laughs> come on. Well, while Nina thinks well, of that I'll hardball question, as I think Robbie is going to turn to, you want to turn yes. to the group. Yeah. Yeah. We had a question in the audience, All right. I think, yeah. Go ahead. Make sure you press your buttons, by the way, I'm told. By the you lose, you lose some of the love for whatever it is that you have as your hobby when it becomes your, your life because you're actually depending on it for you know, your livelihood. Um, were there ever moments like that with Zagat um, or had at that point it become so successful you didn't really have to worry about that? But um, what would you say to, to that? And one thing about what you said that is, reminds me of another general rule 
it's never a bad idea to have a separate source right. of income mm -hmm. when you're doing your crazy idea. So we were both practicing law and uh, did not need to rely on the business until the business reached a stage where we could. We didn't do it until we knew that our business was going to be a success. And then we did it in turns. Tim went first, and I kept practicing law. And then a couple of years later, I also joined. So you know, we were doing it first, both of us working. And then you know, we did it in stages. So we were very cautious. And we never were in that the position you describe, which I agree would be very difficult. Also, there are times when doing what you love still entails its work. And you're doing this you know, 24 hours a day or thinking about it and working 12 to 16 hours. It can be work. Uh, it happens that it's much nicer to do work you like than to do work you don't like. And you could be in an investment bank or at a law firm working the same hours and hating it. Uh, and not working for yourself. So it's a, it is a trade-off. The other thing that I think needs to be pointed out, everybody thinks of us as restaurant guides, but we do nightlife, shopping, travel, landmarks, hotels, movies, music, theater. And what we do, I think, could be, and I'd love to see it applied to a lot of other areas, including uh, democracy. What I would add to um, your answer, too, is that you know, at the time that we started our business, being a total failure would have been a big black mark on our careers. Today, people are much more ready to start new businesses. And failure at um, an entrepreneurial venture is generally regarded as a step towards going into your next one. So it doesn't have the same negative connotation that it had in um, you know, 1980. It's completely different. Your parents are not going to say you're an idiot for doing this when they, you say, Dad, I'm like Bill Gates. Right. <laughs> no, but I mean, it, you know, certainly throughout Silicon Valley, it's sort of you know, a good thing. There's a question over here. Uh, maybe talk about the benefits and challenges of starting a business as a couple and running a business as a couple. Maybe share some anecdotes that relate to that. First of all, you better have a good marriage. <laughs> uh, second of all, um, you know, like any other business, there are times when we disagree. And every business, you will disagree with people. The nice thing is we're, we know we're trying to get to the same place, and we're not being political. So when we're all rowing on the same oars, we, I know that if Nina disagrees with me, nonetheless, she's looking after the end goal that I am, and vice versa, which makes it a lot better to um, collaborate and to disagree. But also, I think um, it's what the key to our being able to be successful together is that we have very different ways of looking at problems and different talents. You know, if we were both exactly cut out of the same cloth, um, it would be much more difficult. But the things that Tim's best at are the things I'm weakest at, and the, and, and the opposite. I mean, Tim, you know, I was the one who insisted that we spend what at the time uh, we both thought was an unga ungodly amount of money in creating Zagat.com. Um, and I was always the one who was the most frugal one in the business, making sure that we didn't spend too much. But I somehow just believed in this and knew so strongly that it was what we had to do. And finally, Tim said, all right. You know, so. That's when she threatened to stop my uh, expense budget for meals. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I, I, think, I think you have to look at the array of talents and make sure that you've got the different bases covered that you'll need to do a business. That's a uh, really great question. Now, so many times we hear about the romantic view of the mom and pop shop as a as what it takes to launch that kind of business. But I think it's just as impressive to have a, at least from the standpoint of, of my friends, having a 45-year marriage stay together, let alone a 32-year business. It's 49. Business. 29, 29, okay. 49. 49. 49, 49 years. 49 next week. So you, that's right. <laughs> wow. 
Mr. Robbie, I, I thought you were going to wave your finger at me and say, how could you marry a girl at 11? <laughs> Don't do anything to upset the two of them today, all right? We've got one more year out of this, at least, okay, good. There's some other questions, Robbie? Can I just say, nobody has asked what everybody always asks, what are the things that we couldn't publish? We have a, a thing called takeouts, which we have the best one-liners. And since nobody has asked, I think I ought to mention yes. a few. <laughs> uh, You're too polite. Uh, this is um, also known as Ebola Cafe. Suffers from delusions of adequacy. <laughs> Filled with flowers and all the things that make flowers grow. Oh. How do you say roadkill in Chinese? <laughs> um, this is one that got us into real trouble because I thought it was risque. And our, I went around to our women editors and said, can we do it? And they said, don't worry, do it. And there's a restaurant called One If By Land, Two If By Sea in Greenwich Village. It was the old carriage house of Aaron Burr. And you recognize the restaurant because half the men are on their knees offering little boxes with jewels in them to the women at their table. And it is very romantic. And so we reported that it was extremely romantic and had firelight and violin music and great beef Wellington. And then the one-liner, which was literal. He said, if this place doesn't get you laid, nothing will. <laughs> and, and uh, What's we, the name of that place again? <laughs> we, I'll one tell you something. We, uh, it turned out my, sensitivi <laughs> my sensitivities were better than the women in our office. But the angriest letter we got was from a man who said, we hadn't lived up to our representation. <laughs> <laughs> now, can you tell us a small why you decided to sell it, you know, to bring to Louis and, you know, on the table in this issue without the big consideration? Well, the way it got started was I got an email from Marissa Mayer, who was at Google at the time. She's now the CEO of Yahoo. And she said that she thought there were so many things that we could be doing together. Could she come in and talk to us? And so I, I remember vividly walking into Tim's office and saying, do you think we could find the time to meet with Google? <laughs> you know, because it was just very exciting to get that email. And so she came in, and we were talking about different things that we might do together. And then um, not too long into the conversation, she was just so excited about the whole thing. She said, well, do you think we would consider an acquisition? And uh, Tim said, well, it would depend on the terms. But then we went out to lunch, and we just had a really good relationship, a great meeting of the minds. She had a um, business development person with her who I later learned uh, yelled at her because she, he, she had promised she wouldn't raise the A word at our meeting, which she had gone ahead and done. And, um, what is the A word, Nina? <laughs> acquisition. Oh, oh, oh. oh. <laughs> and so. Um, it just, you know, it was such an obvious uh, partnership that um, when we really liked each other and um, had lots of the same ideas about future growth, um, discussions kept going on for several months, and then we closed in September. What was your plan to counter to, I mean, Yelp claims they have 117 a million unique viewers a year. They have 75 million reviews, they claim, a year. What was your counter going to be to Yelp and TripAdvisor if, if Marissa Mayer hadn't called? We weren't. We were not interested in what they do, and we're very familiar with what they do. A TripAdvisor actually came to us when they were trying to get original funding. Uh, we wanted to do what we do as well as possible, and that is to build a brand based on trust and accuracy and um, ease of use. And um, TripAdvisor is heavily, you know, is heavily manipulated by the uh, the vendors themselves. Yeah. That's better you say it than me. You know, uh, we we uh, were the, we were the American Hotel Association even admits I, I, it. Uh, anybody can say it except us. Yeah. We were but, planning um, we were planning to grow our business to continue what we were doing. I when, think we, when we you, got that you get a, bit, a brand by being Something, it's not you. We didn't know what a brand was when people started telling us we had a brand. And brand is what other people think when they hear your name. 
And I think over a period of time, more everybody who used us said, this is really incredibly accurate. Uh, they don't screw around. It's fair. Uh, this is easy to use, easy to search. Um, and our goal is to do what we do best and let everybody else in the world do whatever they do and not comment on it. Yes. Could you talk a bit about what it was like to start the website and to go digital and begin changing your business model in 1999? Well, here's a huge dis dis disparity between the two of us. Uh, I was scared to death and didn't understand what we were doing. <laughs> and Nina knew that it was the right thing to do and therefore did it and spent the money to do it. And now it's going to tell you the answer to your question. <laughs> Our idea had been all along to charge people when they came to the site. And um, then when it came time to launch the site, we thought, well, it doesn't feel right. It doesn't seem like the right time to do that. And so we started by saying it was going to be free for six months. And then much like our stay in Paris, we extended that time. and. Um, then at a certain point, we just decided now is the time, and we started charging people to come to the site because it just seemed like, you know, we were offering a valuable service. People were happy to pay us for our print guides. Why shouldn't they pay for the same content online, which in fact was easier to search and had all kinds of benefits? But you know, it's it's a difficult decision to make, and. Um, you know, if we weren't uh, if we weren't interested in making money, um, then maybe we would have left everything out for free. We didn't want a site that was filled with advertising, which was the only alternative. Which, the by the way, I think some of these changes were a matter of either luck or necessity. Um, the fact that we didn't take advertising was partly because we believe in being totally. Uh, aimed at making the user, serving the interests of the user. I think a lot of surveying that's done, uh, and in fact the vast majority of surveying, is being done on behalf of sellers. Uh, people who are trying to market to you, trying to understand what you want, and then helps them target you. Uh, we have always been looking after our users as the end customer who was why we did what we did. And also, the way we did it uh, was largely dictated by what, what the user needs, not what the um, advertiser wants. I think, that, I think that's an important point, because you can see that whole reviews could be done with a very different lens, and it would look very different. I think one of the things I like about it is the simplicity of it. Like, you know, there's stores on a few different things, and it's not like, oh, when should you, you with information? And that sort of gets me, you know, a small question I did back to the audience. Maybe I'm the only one curious about this, and Nina tells me you're responsible for the 30-point scale. So I was just wondering, like, why 30 points? It's like tennis. Where did you come up with? Um, so normally you have 10 or 100 or some version of that. Yeah. Number one, when we were doing the Paris thing, we were looking at other guides, and they had one, two, three, the Michelin guide, and one, two, four, Go Me O. And I just didn't think, I thought, one to three, one to four was a uh, generally used uh, standard or range in those days. But uh, I didn't think it was nuanced enough, and I didn't think it gave people enough uh, information in defining uh, what the experience would be. So I said, let's multiply it by 10. And that's all. I think it turned out we were right. But not everybody thinks that. And uh, if you look at an awful lot of people giving rating scales, most of them in the US use zero to five, which I find is, um, it concentrates everybody around three to four and doesn't help people as much as it could. And of, over time, the feedback on our voting scale has been great. People love it, and they know what it means. Yes. Um, great hat. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'd love to hear about some of the talks that you guys had with Marissa about what Google and Zagats could do together, maybe five, ten years down the road. Like, does she have any 
kind of sci-fi ideas with Google Glass or something like that that Zagats could play? Um, uh, let me, um, again, briefly introduce Nina Zagat. <laughs> um, Nina really, the, the negotiating process between Nina and Marissa was unbelievably brief. We had a deal and we closed it in a month, which is very unusual for a deal. And the second thing is, Nina, and if, if I had been in the room, I would have said, yes, yes, let's do that. You know, every time Marissa <laughs> mentioned a number, I would have been so excited. And uh, Nina would say, I think that's not quite up to our expectations. <laughs> or, um, she was the negotiator and did a hell of a lot better job than I ever would have done. And also, Marissa and Nina spent more time together talking about goals. Uh, to the extent that Marissa, that Nina can answer your question lawfully, um, go ahead. <laughs> well, you know, it was more, more, 10 years down the road is um, a, long, a longer view than we were discussing and really than um, uh, goes on in most of the planning. I mean, the planning in everything that we do changes so quickly that um, a, a 10 year horizon is um, well, sure you pretty long. Like, you're not betting on things 10 years down the road. Right. But you could be like, oh, it'd be really cool. Well, what, what we were talking about mostly was being able to cover every, I mean, in our vision was to cover every place in the world. Did she want you to do a reservation system like Open Table or anybody else in encroaching space? We, ne we were not planning to do a reservation system. Although, although we did have a partnership with Open yeah. Table. You could reserve through us. You wouldn't know it was Open Table, but it was. Yeah. We, we in fact, were very early investors in Open Table. Oh. In 2000, we invested in Open Table. We wrote off the investment twice and made a lot of money uh, at the end of the day when they did their IPO. Yeah. Excellent. Because, to your point, <laughs> A lot of businesses fail, and Open Table, our CFO told us twice that you know there was no place that this was not going anywhere, mm. that they were essentially the, up. The thing that I think was important is when we were uh, onboarded, uh, we started surveying all kinds of places around the world, and with the idea that I think Google has about a hundred million or some huge number of places uh, on Google Maps and that at least the best of those places, the million or two million that were the real stars, uh, would be surveyed by Zagat, and the Zagat brand would be a kind of a badge of honor for the better places around the world. But you know, and, and the reason um, for the short timeline was, uh, Tim and I knew that our very busiest season would begin in September. And either we had to know that we would close this deal by September, or we had to get busy doing our you know, regular expansion. So uh, you know, we really focused on either this is serious or it's not serious. Either we work out our questions or we don't. And so that's why everything was very short. And we didn't really have as much time as um, might have been possible. We were blue sky things for the very long range, but basically what we were talking about was how to cover all the places in every vertical. We were also Google might want. We were also sworn to secrecy uh, by Google, and that had the uh, additional effect that there were only two of us who were actually three who knew that there was anything happening, and therefore we didn't have enough people to go deep into the documents uh, and do the normal due diligence. We just uh, had to say, oh, we can't do that. It was just Nina and Tim. I think we have time for one last question. Yes. Number three, good developments over the years. Ah. Ah. Um, the long version or the short version? How much time we have? Uh, the three minute version, yeah. All right. Uh, <laughs> um, literally, at every level, from sophistication and interest of diners to education, to the ingredients that are available and to their uh, shipping and packaging, to the uh, diversity of cuisines, uh, to the 
literally every, and to the number of restaurants and to the efficiency of, of dining, the average inflation over the last 35 years in New York restaurants has been about a little over two and two, two and a half percent. Uh, everything else has been 4%. Now that divergency becomes major. The fact is that more and more young people, young business people, young lawyers, uh, eat out as a way of life and have to. And they're better off spending 30 bucks at a restaurant than going home an hour early and annoying their bosses. And particularly when their time is being billed at $200 an hour, um, you're better off being in the restaurant. There isn't an element of the restaurant industry that hasn't changed. The 1966 uh, Immigration Act opened the country to Asian immigrants and South American immigrants. When we first started, we had 19 national cuisines reflected. We are now over 90 in New York. I mean, the difference is so amazing. The School Lunch Act, when I went to school, I hate to date myself, but when I went to school, I carried a lunchbox with whatever my mother put in it. And at some point after the School Lunch Act went in, 1960s, 70s, 80s, every school had a cafeteria. So you were all brought up going out to eat. You didn't have your parents cooking for you and putting a sandwich in. So you're, you were completely acclimated and trained to eat out, and you will always eat out as a result. Anyway, there's lots of lots of other things. I think there should be a book about it. Well, and I bet there should be another book that you guys write on it, and uh, we'd love to see it written. For those of you who can't wait to have that book written, <laughs> some of you are fortunate joining us for lunch uh, afterwards. Uh, the caterer is uh, Casia, so we're very worried about what kind of review we're going to get. We didn't just use Yale Dining for lunch. Yes, Tim? Could I ask everybody here, you were eating and we were suffering. Um, <laughs> Uh, would you put up your hand if you thought your lunch was uh, good? That's a one, one. Just put up your hand if you thought it was good. Uh, would you put up your hand if you thought it was very good, too? Oh. Relative to what we usually hear? Yeah. <laughs> All right, two. Good qualifier. Uh, would you put up your hand if you thought it was really great, three? I've never seen a three at any business school I've ever spoken to. <laughs> well, uh, you know, that's well done. There's something where uh, I, we should close right now and thank our guests, but of course, I never do what we should do. If you could spare another 20 seconds, this is just for Tim, since some of you will have seen this uh, in my class before, but Tim would want to know how we close out such a session. <laughs> Alone? Follow me, sir. <laughs> this way, sir. <laughs> you can see it in front. You can see it in front if you want. Ah. Jim. Oh, oh. Would you care for a cocktail, sir? Yes, I'd like a Totkin Vonick. A Totkin Vonick? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very good, sir. Oh, and Captain, could you turn out the spotlight, please? Certainly. And could everybody go back to talking? <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> this is wonderful. <laughs> I, I really you need this, I need this one, good. too. Well, you get the idea, is I, I, we could not have a better set of not just lunchtime speakers, but <laughs> people to take us through a lifetime of both of, of love, creation, entrepreneurship, contribution, and getting even into nutrition. Uh, thanks so much, and Dean Post, you escaped the cold call, in a law, in a, it's not a law school classroom, but wonderful job, Nina and Tim. Thank you very much, Robbie. Yeah.